All right, guys, we are at Evening Devotion. Welcome, everyone. A little bit late because I've been talking with some Army buddies on the phone for a while. We're going to be reading out of Josiah 6, 26. Cursed be the man before the Lord that riseth up and buildeth this city, Jericho. Now, we know what Jericho was. They've done a lot of, they found it. They've done a bunch of research. Jericho was thought to be a, a city that nobody knew about or that well, didn't exist, rather. Um, they said everything was fabricated. Well, then they found it. They found it in the last couple of years. And they said everything the Bible says about it is true. And it matches perfectly. Uh, and they believe that was a Nephilim stronghold. So pretty interesting history behind all that. If you uh, feel so disposed, you can go Google some of that stuff and look that up. It's pretty interesting what, what they're finding there. They're still uh, excavating it. So we're going to go back to Josiah 6.26. This is the end of the chapter. Then Josiah charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. I think he was talking about human remains being put in there, and they found some <laughs> in the walls. Uh, let's go up a little bit here. One, two, three, four, five. Verse 21. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men who had spied out this country, Go into the harlot's house, and from there bring out this woman and all that she has, as you swore to her. And the young men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. And we know, you know, the history of Rahab. Rahab is actually within the lineage of Jesus Christ. The Bible says she was righteous even though she was a harlot. How interesting. We can learn a lot from reading the Bible and paying attention to the individuals and the lives that they lived and what the Lord considered righteousness because it causes you to pay a little more attention to the heart than the external evidences. Then Joshua charged them at that time, saying, Cursed be the man before the Lord who rises up and builds this city Jericho. He shall lay its foundation with his firstborn, and with his youngest he shall set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout all the country. Our devotion is thus, since he was cursed who rebuilt Jericho, much more the man who labors to restore popery among us. Let's listen very closely here. In our father's days, the gigantic walls of popery fell by the power of their faith, the perseverance of their efforts and the blast of their gospel trumpets. And now there are some who would rebuild that accursed system upon its old foundation. O oh Lord, be pleased to thwart their unrighteous endeavors and pull down every stone which they build. It should be a serious business with us to be thoroughly purged of every error which may have a tendency to foster the spirit of popery. And when we have made a clean sweep at home, we should seek in every way to oppose its all too rapid spread abroad in the church and in the world. This last can be done in secret by fervent prayer and in public by decided testimony. We must warn with judicious boldness those who are inclined towards the errors of Rome. We must instruct the young in gospel truth and tell them of the black doings of popery in the olden times. We must aid in spreading the light more thoroughly through the land. For priests, like owls, hate daylight. Are we doing all we can for Jesus in the gospel? If not, our negligence plays into the hands of the priestcraft. What are we doing to spread the Bible? Which is the Pope's bane and poison. Are we casting abroad good, sound gospel writings? Luther once said, The devil hates goose quills, and doubtless he has good reason, for ready writers, by the Holy Spirit's blessings, have done this kingdom much damage. If the thousands who will read this short word this night will do all they can to hinder the rebuilding of this accursed Jericho, the Lord's glory shall speed among the sons of men. Reader, what can you do? What will you do? See, the history of the popery 
goes back a long, long time. Beginnings of the Catholic Church technically didn't start with Peter. It started after. It was Satan's attempt to infiltrate the church and control it. Uh, the state came in and put the church under Constantine, put the church under state protection and quote-unquote state control. That gave Satan the ability to do whatever he wanted with the church, to dictate how the church was to preach, what the church was to preach, or what not to preach. And slowly, over the last 2,000 years, Satan has done a very good job of limiting the church. But see, the church isn't a building or an organization. The church is an entity. It is a people's. It is a, a group. It is a spirit. It is a, a living, breathing thing. Oh, that was the sun. The light got really weird in here all of a sudden. What would... What good would it do to get back into a system that classically and historically has done everything it can to bring down the truth? There's stories of people that have gotten in fistfights with Catholic priests who grabbed them and tried to choke them to death. Or one, one guy, he was a womanizer, a drunkard, a fighter, a brawler, and he got saved. And he stood outside the Catholic church in some town, I forget where it was, preaching. This was a long time ago. The preacher came out, grabbed him, and held him down, tried to drown him in the fountain. Well, he was a brawler. He was a fighter. He was a boxer. He gave him a right cross, knocked him out, got up, wiped his face off, went inside, stood in the, the Catholic Church's pulpit, and preached the gospel of truth to the people. Are we not doing everything we can, like this guy asks, to stand against those things, to stand up for what the truth really is instead of what they say it is? I mean, they've written their own Bible, for crying out loud. This is what makes a false religion. The Bible isn't good enough, we're going to write our own. Who's done that in religion or belief systems that we know today? Catholic Church, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses. They are not Christians. But, but they believe in Jesus. They are not Christians. Muslims believe in Jesus. They're not Christians. I just think we need to be more inclusive. No. The gospel isn't inclusive. It's exclusive. Heaven isn't inclusive, it's exclusive. Heaven is exclusively for those who believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And only preach what he said to preach and nothing more. What do we have people out here doing? Doing everything they can to preach anything but what he said to preach. Denying the very word they say they were sent to deliver. And instead, preaching every other kind of heresy they can possibly come up with. It's all satanic. At its very core, it's satanic. This is one of the reasons how we know that the uh, false prophet, the, the main guy in the end times, is going to be, he's going to come out of the Catholic Church. He's going to come out of the Vatican, out of the Popery. It may be the very man that's up there today. A lot of things he said and done have sure put him in that criteria. The way we fight this is to stand up in truth. And when they come with their false doctrine, we say, no, this is what it says. And you will not change my mind. The Bible says this, and that's what it means. There, there's no other, there's no hidden, special, divine understanding that is that needs to take place here. It, it is very plain. We can't just agree to disagree. People love to say that. Well, let's just agree to disagree. We can't agree to disagree. There's only one interpretation. There's only one Bible. There's only one scripture. If I agree to disagree with you when you're completely wrong and, and in her heresy, preaching heretical things, now I've put myself in agreement with you and the Bible says that I have a condemnation because of that. I don't want that. I don't want blood on my hands. I would rather hurt your feelings. I would rather offend you with the gospel, which the Bible says it's the rock of offense. Jesus is the rock of offense. I'd rather offend you, but have you see the truth and receive it, hopefully, prayerfully, than to agree to disagree and have you still walk in unbelief, in lies, and in heresy. It's not fair for me to do that to you when I know the truth. It's not fair for me to watch you get in a car and go, hey... 
you can't leave in this. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. I don't know how to, No, you can't take this car. No, there's a... Listen to me. The brakes are disconnected. You can't take this car. It, the brakes don't work. Oh, no, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. If I didn't put my body in front of that car, if I didn't grab you by the collar and jerk you out of the driver's seat and take the keys away from you and yell at you and tell you, stupid, you need to pay attention. There are no brakes on this vehicle. If you leave, you will die. What kind of person would I be? Because that's not truth. Ladies and gentlemen, whether we do it in a ministry like this, we do it in a ministry in a church, if we do it in our home ministries, in our personal lives, let us always stand up for the truth all the time. Christ is worth it. He's worth it. And the people deserve the truth. I love you all. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I will see you in the next video.